Hey, are you a skeptic or know somebody in your life that's a skeptic? Because I know this time of year, a lot of people start asking, did Jesus really die and rise from the dead? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! That's why I want to give the skeptics cheat sheet to the resurrection of Jesus. It's right here on this page. Stick with me today and you'll get the secret on Church Door. Hey, what's up? My name is Ian. Welcome back to Church Store. Do us a quick favor. Give this video a like so that it shoots it up in the algorithm, pushing it out to other people just like you so that they can be also blessed by this video today. And also, we remind you, we're here every single Sunday at 1130 Central Standard Time. We want to pray with you. We want to walk with you. If you have a question, just reach out to us in the chat box where you can text prayer to the number you see coming up on the screen. This Sunday amongst Christians is the Sunday we call Palm Sunday. It's because of the palm branches that were laid down on the ground before Jesus as he entered Jerusalem during the celebration of Passover. This event inaugurates the week called Holy Week, the week before the death and resurrection of Jesus. So often on this Sunday, we return to these passages that are held in the gospel known as the triumphant entry. So let's start our week off by reading Luke's account of this story. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had been told, and they were untying the colt, and its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the crowd of the disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, only had known on this day what brings you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Now, why am I starting this way? I don't typically just start right out of the gate with all the scripture that we digest in one week. And the reason why is because I want to first establish in our minds a scene. What was happening at that moment? Then use the other synoptic gospel accounts to elevate this story for us today. Often we come to these passages year after year with a celebratory outlook. And yes, Jesus came. He is the king. He died and he rose again. Yet... We only know this because we have the full picture. Therefore, we can often glaze over the nuances of this story just by itself. This story by itself does not paint the same hopefulness we have as Christians in 2023, having now received the complete revelation of Jesus. When we read these stories carefully, what we see is a massive crowd of people surrounding Jesus who just didn't get it. They were missing the point and I don't know about you, but I have people in my life that are missing the gospel. They've heard it clearly many times, yet somehow they continue to reject it. And truth be told, this has been myself at times. In my early 20s, there was a movement known as New Atheism. This movement included people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris, all taking aim at Christianity militantly. I mean, they weren't out softly presenting their view in the public square. They were on a mission to destroy religious faith. Let's be honest, they were oftentimes persuasive. So much so, I began to really struggle internally. Was I dedicating my life to a lie? I had just finished my ministry degree and was now serving in ministry full time. But on the inside, I was really wondering if I had strongly miscalculated the direction of my life. Simultaneously, in another part of the country, a close friend of mine was going through the exact same struggle. But for him, it was even worse. 
He disclosed to me in a text that he was leaving Christianity. He was now an agnostic or maybe a soft atheist, but he didn't really know what he believed anymore. And ultimately, I was absolutely crushed. I couldn't understand why someone so close to my walk in Christianity was now denouncing our cherished faith. Around this time of year, more than any time of year, the skeptics look by and scoff at the story of a risen Messiah. They want to give every reason that the resurrection is a sham or untrue. And the truth is they, like my close friend and even the crowds who chanted Hosanna the week before Christ's crucifixion, are missing something. That's why I think the story of Palm Sunday is a key primer for us to understand how we approach the truth of the story of Easter. So I'm calling this message today, The Skeptic's Cheat Sheet to the Resurrection of Jesus. Maybe you are the skeptic. Maybe it's you that is questioning the validity of the story of Jesus Christ. And in that questioning, I want to say, great, at least you're asking questions. Hmm. And it's my deepest belief that when we truly seek Jesus, he will be found. But if this is not you, you are completely and firmly convinced that the gospel of Jesus is truth. Don't tune out because I want to give you something that might help you navigate sharing the truth of Jesus with other people who are struggling to believe. Now a skeptic is defined like this. One who instinctively or habitually doubts, questions, or disagrees with assertions or generally accepted conclusions. There's a second equally important definition that goes like this. One that is inclined to skepticism of religious matters. The hundred million dollar question is how do people get to the point of skepticism? What leads people to instinctively doubt or disagree with religious matters? Now certainly many things lead to this skepticism, but what I've seen, especially in the faith arena, is that skepticism often comes after a major letdown. Which makes sense, right? It's only natural to protect yourself when you get hurt or if something didn't quite meet your expectations. This very clearly happened to the crowds during the triumphant entry because during the entry of Jesus, they were singing his praises and just a few days later, they were calling for his crucifixion. Why did this happen? Because they broke a key rule to understanding the gospel. And this is what's on the cheat sheet. If you want to know Jesus, we must meet him for who he is, not for what we want him to be. Oftentimes people become skeptical of the gospel of Jesus because he just doesn't fit their notion of who the savior should be. Hmm. And so it was for the crowds at the triumphant Ooh. entry. Why were the crowds cheering for Jesus? And the gospel gives us two clues to why they were cheering and both were misunderstandings of who Jesus was and what he had come to do. Hmm. The first thing they had believed is that he was an earthly political king coming to sit on the throne of Israel like David did in power and earthly dominance. In verse 41, it says that Jesus was weeping. The original Greek actually connotates that this was uncontrollable sobbing, like boo-hoo crying, just like a mother would weep at a funeral. And why? It was because they didn't get it. They were looking for their king the way they wanted their king, not a king who would die for the sake of the whole world. Let's be honest. We don't want Jesus to be the true king of our life. Maybe we want him to be the king of our religious life, but not our entire life, which is what he is looking for. For many there, Jesus is best served a few Sundays each year. And outside of that, Jesus is no more king to them than the king or queen of England. Jesus wasn't looking to sit on the throne with a crown and scepter in hand, ready to dominate and rule the nations. Jesus had come to sit on the throne of the heart of each and every man, woman, and child, and to lead them to true salvation, which is reconciliation from their broken relationship with God. No earthly king could ever do that for us. In the book of John chapter 12, he reminds us that this triumphant entry happened during the celebration of Passover, a lush symbolic celebration designed to remind Israel of God's deliverance from their oppression in Egypt. Israel, just a few hundred years early, had lost everything and found itself once again under the oppression of an enemy king. 
even though by the time of the triumphant entry, they had been restored to their promised land that God had given them, and their temple had been rebuilt, which represented the presence of God, they still had not received the king that they felt the prophets had prophesied. So they wanted Jesus to meet their expectation, not to accept Jesus for who he was, the humble, suffering servant foretold by the prophet Isaiah. This suffering servant was prophesied to suffer in our place, bear the punishment for our sins and the sins of the world, and finally, in triumph, intercede on our behalf in the presence of God. Yet Israel missed it. They wanted a powerful king to merely fill the throne of David. But Jesus is much, much much more than that. The second thing they mistakenly believed was that Jesus was some type of magic bullet for all their physical ailments and struggles. John 12, 9 through 11 says this about the triumphant entry. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on the account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Why were they coming to Jesus in flocks? It's because he had miraculous powers. He had raised the dead. He had healed the sick. He had made the lame to walk again. And I mean, who doesn't want that, right? Hmm. And certainly this is still true. Jesus miraculously heals and by the power of his Holy Spirit is still healing today. But Jesus is looking for much more than just a simple resolution to your physical brokenness. He's looking to heal your spiritual brokenness above all, to be the restorer of our relationship with our heavenly Father and Creator. And this is because our spiritual brokenness is much more crippling than our physical brokenness. I cannot tell you how many people I've heard articulate, well, I, I really prayed hard and Jesus didn't heal me. Or my mother was dying and I prayed so hard, yet she still died. So Jesus must not be real. Listen, friends, we have to understand our physical struggle is only an outward picture of the deep inward battle that rages in our hearts. Jesus could heal you and make you perfect in your physical body all day long. And still, at the end of the day, your heart is dying because of your sin. Matthew 10, 28 says, Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The reasons we have to celebrate Jesus are not simply to do with what he can do on the outside, but the salvation he brings to our broken relationship with God on the inside. So if you're that skeptic that feels that the gospel of Jesus has let you down, remember the cheat code. We must meet Jesus for who he is, not for what we try to make him be. Who is Jesus? He's the Savior. Hosanna, which is what that word means, Savior, Helper. He died on the cross in our place and he rose again, forgiving our sins and making us right with God once again. If you're watching this for the very first time, do us a quick favor and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that every single time we put out a piece of content, it's going to come directly to you. Or you can go the extra mile by going to rivervalleyrockford.org slash give and making a donation there. That donation is going to go to help other people just like you take their next step with Jesus. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. We're so glad that you've taken one step closer to Jesus. Our prayer for you this week, if you're doubting or if you're looking to get closer to Jesus, is that you look to him for who he is. And as you look to him for who he is, he will reveal himself to you in perfect clarity. Go pursue him this week. We'll see you again here next week.